Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Psych 3510. Today, we're going to uh, go over the second part of Chapter 8, which is about bivariate correlations and association claims. In Part 1, we learned uh, just sort of the basics of what a bivariate correlation is, um, the types of variables that are required for an association claim, and thus the conduction of a bivariate correlation um, statistical test. And then we learned how we describe correlations using both uh, directionality, so positive or negative correlation, and then strength, um, either small, medium, moderate, or strong, or weak, medium, moderate, or strong. And let's remember that uh, the test statistic for a correlation which is just denoted by an, a lowercase r, we just call it r, uh, can range from negative one to one to positive one, such that correlations around zero are weak correlations, meaning there is no relationship between our two continuous measured variables. And then as we move away from zero in either direction, whether positive or negative, the closer we get to uh, positive one or negative one, the stronger the correlation gets. It's such. It's just that negative correlations are an inverse relationship between our variables, and positive correlations are a positive relationship between our variables. So uh, here in part two, what we're going to be working on is um, how we interrogate association claims. And what that means is essentially... It, if you come across an association claim, what are the sorts of questions you should ask yourself or ask of the data uh, so that you can understand um, how valid uh, that claim is, how, in fact, how strong that claim is, and whether or not you should put any uh, faith into that claim, whether should you believe the claim that's been made or not. Because let's remember, people make lots of claims, both uh, inside and outside of the research world. But just because someone has made a claim does not mean that we should believe that claim. And we have some tools uh, that we can use to interrogate claims and make judgments about um, uh, their appropriateness uh, or lack thereof. So we're going to look at our four validities. And these validities are in essence, our tools are magnifying glasses, if you will, for us to pick apart and interrogate all kinds of research claims. And uh, today we're talking about association claims. So we're going to look at construct validity, which is how well was each variable measured. Statistical validity, we're going to talk about this a little bit here in part two, and then we're really going to pick up with statistical validity in part three, where we actually learn how to calculate in our correlation test statistic. Third will be internal validity, which is all about causal inferences and um, sort of spoiler alert, right? We're making association claims, not causal claims. Um, and so we'll be discussing why the, the really specific details about why association claims do not allow causal inference. And lastly, external validity, which is how well uh, does this finding generalize to a larger population? So first up is construct validity. And we need to ask a few questions about each of the variables. So remember, in a correlation or an association claim, we have measured two variables. And we want to ask each of these questions about each of those two variables. So how well was each of the variables measured? So if we're looking at maybe depression as one of our measurements, did we have professionals evaluate our, our participants on their level of depression? Did we use an approved sort of valid, reliable uh, measurement tool that exists in the literature? Or did we just ask people, hey, from 1 to 10, how depressed are you? Uh, because if we just asked for self-report on depression, we might want to soften our claim. We might want to qualify our claim that, uh, you know, people's scores on depression were not 
uh, were not evaluated by a medical uh, or mental health professional. And so that measurement tool might not be as good as, as other tools of measurement. So we also want to ask about the reliability of our measurement tools. So whatever survey or questions that were asked, um, are, are they established in the literature and have they been found to be reliable? And remember, reliability means the ability to measure something over and over again and get the same result. So if I gave you a, uh, a measurement of depression and you scored, you know, let's say it's, it's 1 to 100 and you scored a 54, uh, today on a measurement of depression. If I had a good measure of depression, then if I gave it to you tomorrow, you should also score a 54 or, you know, roughly like right around a 54. If I gave it to you the third day, you should score right around a 54 because that means that um, my measurement tool of depression is not impacted by uh, daily fluctuations. What it's actually measuring is your sort of state level of depression versus if I give it to you today and you score a 23 and I give it to you tomorrow and you score a 75, um, you know, unless something devastating and dramatic has happened to you in the last 24 hours, there might be a problem with my measurement tool for it to vary so wildly across a 24 hour uh, time frame. It, it's not a reliable measure. We want to ask, is this thing even measuring what it's intended to measure? Uh, so if I'm, if I'm, uh, if one of my variables is intelligence, you know, should I use high school GPA? Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of really intelligent people who just didn't do well in high school because they weren't motivated. I know a lot of um, fairly unintelligent people who did really well in high school because they took easy classes. So uh, if we're interested in intelligence, you know, GPA might have something to do with intelligence, but is it actually intelligence? Is it actually what we intend to measure? And then of course we want to check our validities, uh, our, our face con uh, uh, concurrent, discriminant and convergent validity for these measurement tools. Okay, our second tool for interrogating an association claim is statistical validity, uh, or basically how well do the data support the conclusion? Because not all data are created equally, right? And we can tell this just from our very basic recent discussions about correlations about our, that are statistic. If I have a correlation of 0.25, that's not as strong as a correlation of 0.5 or 0.7 or 0.8. As, that, as the magnitude of that correlation increases, we have better evidence for the relationship between these two variables, right? They have a stronger uh, relationship that provides more support, right? We're more confident about a correlation of negative 0.85 than we are about a correlation of negative 0.15. And so we can call these things loosely, right, effect sizes. So our R serves as an effect size. It, it quantifies the nature of the effect such that if we remember our metrics around 0.1 or negative 0.1 is small or weak. Around plus or minus 0.3 is medium or moderate. And around plus or minus 0.5 is large. Now, um, Moving forward in part three, we will learn how to assess statistical significance, uh, but that's one of the things that we want to uh, keep in mind when we're discussing statistical validity. Uh, is this correlation statistically significant? And that will uh, be based upon quite a few things, as we'll see here in part three. Particularly with association claims, uh, they are often impacted, or, or maybe not often, or they can be significantly impacted by outliers, by extreme individuals uh, who are sort of pulling everything towards them. If you remember our discussion from um, sort of the normal distribution and the normal curve and things like skewness, it can be uh, quite easy for a single extreme individual uh, to, to pull a data set towards it, right? If, um, if you were in a room with 15 people 
and I asked you how many um, NBA All-Star games you have played in, uh, odds are those 15 people all together have played in zero NBA All-Star games. But if Michael Jordan walked in the room, right, he would completely change the average for those people, right? All, all of a sudden now, um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many NBA All-Star games Michael Jordan played in. It's probably something like around 14, 15, 16. Um, and so suddenly the average would be like one NBA All-Star game, even though 15 of those people had played in zero All-Star games and one of them had played in 15 or 16 All-Star games, right? That one outlier, Michael Jordan, makes the rest of us look very different than we actually are. So we want to be aware of potential outliers. This is often why we visualize association claims using a scatter plot, right? If we can, if we can see it on a graph and see each individual score, uh, then we can actually identify potential outliers. And, and we're not going to get into in this class what we would do about that, but there are uh, statistical methods that can help us account for those outliers. Uh, is there a restriction of range? Uh, this is basically, if you remember back a few weeks ago, uh, do we have a floor or a ceiling effect, right? Has, uh, is, is our measurement tool um, sort of getting lopped off on one end where everyone is packing in the low end or the high end, or it's maybe it's impossible to score beyond a certain point and that will impact uh, the nature of our decision uh, because now all of a sudden the variable looks less um, continuous, right? We want things that fall on a scale, a range, 0 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000. Uh, those are good variables for association claims. If you have a variable that's range is restricted for some reason, uh, you, you maybe a ceiling or a floor effect, um, it, it behaves in a way that we don't like for it to behave. And... Lastly, do we have a curvilinear relationship? Or uh, you, you've probably heard um, a, more often about one particular type of curvilinear relationship being an exponential relationship, right? So uh, variables that have exponential relationships violate some of the assumptions of an association claim and a correlation, and, and we don't like that. We, we, we would need a different statistic to evaluate um, that nonlinear or curvilinear relationship. So uh, a, an example of a good curvilinear um, variable would be um, uh, rate of death across age, right? So uh, rate of death across age, if we graph that, it looks like a big U because young children are, uh, are much more likely to die and the elderly are much more likely to die, right? Sort of on the far left of that graph, we would get high scores. On the far right of that graph, we would get high scores. And then everything in the middle, right, from like, you know, five years of age to 65 years of age, mortality is very low, right? That's sort of the bottom of the U. And so we have this nonlinear, this U-shaped curvilinear relationship. And correlations are not that great of a statistic for evaluating these relationships. We're not going to go into, again, uh, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, the statistics we would use for a curvilinear relationship, but just know correlations are not that statistic. So again, effect size describes the strength. We can see that this bottom uh, scatter plot is stronger. This is going to be a larger R value. Uh, than the top scatter plot, right? Which is going to be smaller because there's more, more noise here. Uh, there's more variability around what would be our line of best fit. Again, our cone of uncertainty, the sort of oval of uncertainty, if we drew it around the whole scatter plot, is much larger, is much wider for the top one. So that means the, the relationship is less obvious than this tightly packed group of data on the bottom scatter plot where the relationship is more obvious. So our graph labeled B here would produce a stronger correlation than the graph labeled A. And so we can visualize that again uh, as distance around the line of best fit. So on the left here, we see very tightly packed data around the line of best fit. 
such that uh, this variable is height at age two on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is height at age 18. So we can see that a person's height at age two is highly predictive, has a very strong relationship with their height at age 18, right? This is very tight around our line of best fit. There's not a whole lot of variability. So if we were given uh, your height at age two, we would be pretty certain about how tall you're going to be as an 18 year old. Versus the graph on the right, the scatter plot on the right, where we see mother's height on the x-axis and then son's adult height on the y-axis. And there's a lot more variability. Um, your mom's height does not necessarily predict uh, her son's height. So for example, uh, you know, I'm roughly six foot one, somewhere between six foot and six foot one. Uh, my mom is fairly short. She's like five, five. Uh, and her height is, is a very poor predictor, has a very weak relationship with my height. And, and we see that at the population level as well by looking at the distance around this uh, line of best fit of our, uh, of our data. And in fact, um, we could think about the sort of accumulation of these distances as a way that we, uh, that we calculate this effect size, right? So the less distance we have from the line of best fit, the stronger the relationship. The more distance we have around the line of best fit, the weaker relationship we have. So uh, this next point is the correlation statistically significant. Um, and the rest of them, uh, we're really going to return to during hypothesis testing during our next lecture. So we'll just kind of put a pin in that and, and come back to it in part three. So next, uh, internal validity. Can we make a causal inference from an association? Uh, the answer, surprise, surprise, is going to be no. Uh, but here we're going to learn about why the answer to that question is no. So there are three criteria necessary to make a causal claim. The first is called covariance. Basically, are your variables related to each other? Are they, in a sense, correlated to one another? Uh, one thing cannot cause another thing if they do not have a statistical relationship. So step one is to evaluate whether you two, your two variables have a statistical relationship. And so with association claims, the answer to question one is often yes, right? We're, we look good on the, the causal criteria of what we call covariance, right? Does, is A related to B in some way? Criteria number two, which can get a little more dicey, is temporal precedence. Uh, temporal just means time, right? Having to do with time. Precedence meaning uh, first or coming first. So temporal precedence means, are we able to tell which variable comes first, is measured first or, um, uh, or occurs before the other variable? Because if we're gonna claim that A causes B, then A must occur in time prior to B, right? So um, if studying is going to have a causal relationship to your exam grade, then the studying we're talking about has to happen before the exam. It, it doesn't make any sense to claim that the studying you did after the exam caused your exam grade, right? So if, if A is study time and B is your exam grade, then the way that we measured A or study time, we need to be able to tell that this study time comes before when you took the exam or B. So if we cannot establish temporal precedence, then we cannot make a causal claim, right? We cannot literally violate the laws of physics. Um, and so uh, oftentimes in correlational research, we violate temporal precedence. We can't tell um, which variable sort of quote unquote comes first. Uh, maybe they're co-occurring um, within the individual, 
uh, and it becomes difficult for us to assert temporal precedence. And so we have to stop and say that we fall short of a causal claim uh, and uh, we cannot uh, we cannot move forward. We, we are left with an association claim. So for example, if A and B were, if A was your height and B was your weight, um, you know, I measure, maybe you go to the doctor and they measure your height and weight at the same time. Uh, it doesn't really even make sense to ask the question, well, which comes first, height or weight? Like they, they just co-occur simultaneously within the individual, right? You possess each of them throughout time in, in the same manner. Um, one does not come before the other one. And so because of that, we cannot make a causal claim, right? Just, just because you are tall does not mean that you will be heavy. And just because that you are short does not mean that you will be light, right? We, we cannot assert a causal claim because we cannot establish temporal precedence uh, with those variables. And lastly, internal validity. And uh, this is the real problem for association claims. Even if a, an association claim can meet the first two criteria, it is nearly always going to violate the principle of internal validity. And remember, internal validity is the idea that the thing you think is doing the causing, right? If A is, if I claim that A is causing B, uh, internal validity means that A is actually causing B. There's not some other possible uh, third variable, we'll call it C over here. Uh, there's not some other third variable that could be impacting them. We sort of briefly mentioned this uh, in part one. Uh, we'll expand upon this a little bit here. But it's the idea that um, the reason that experiments allow us to make causal claims is because in an experiment where a researcher controls the environment and manipulates the environment, we can eliminate these third variables, right? I can, for example, control for age, or I can control for education. I can control for race or ethnicity uh, such that those extraneous variables uh, are not impacting my variables of interest, right? And, and we can only control those things in an experiment. If I measured, let's, let's stick with A and B, height and weight. Uh, if I measured height and weight, um, and I wanna make a causal claim from that height causes weight, uh, maybe a third variable C, which is diet or exercise, right? Or genetics, right? Or, um, you know, there's, there's a whole host uh, of other variables that could be impacting differentially, right? Height or weight, uh, or both some a little bit, or depending upon a lot of things, right? It, it, the waters become very muddied when we start including third variables that might be having an impact uh, on our variables of interest. And so because we just asked people their height and weight, uh, we were unable to control for diet or genetics or ethnicity uh, or all those other things that we know um, potentially impact both uh, height and weight. So let's look at, at an example uh, against our three causal criteria. Here we have height and self-esteem, uh, and we find that taller people tend to have higher self-esteem, right? We have a, a positive, and this looks like a fairly moderate, maybe, correlation, probably something around 0.3 or 0.4. Uh, we have a, a pretty obvious relationship and a fairly tight oval or cone of uncertainty. Uh, but let's talk about which of these criteria are met. Uh, by this example. Uh, number one is definitely met, right? Um, we uh, we definitely have a relationship. We have covariance. Our two variables are related to one another. We sort of fall apart a little bit at number two, temporal precedence. Uh, it becomes weird to try and say that uh, the person possessed height before they possessed self-esteem. Um, uh, unless we like very explicitly measured like 
height at, you know, uh, in January, and then we measured self-esteem in July, um, it, it becomes difficult to ascertain uh, which of these came first uh, or which of them a person did or possessed uh, prior to the other variable. So we, we kind of start to fall apart here. Maybe there we could conceive of a situation with these two variables where we, we establish temporal precedence, uh, but, but it's not very obvious and it's not clear and it's, it's probably not very likely. And then number three, we really fall apart, right? Um, I measured your height. I measured your self-esteem. I mean, we could we could sit here for 10 minutes and come up with other third variables uh, that might be impacting um, uh, both height and self-esteem, right? Um, so you could think about, you know, genetic impacts. Um, you could think about um, height um maybe maybe determining um your ability at sports or basketball or something like that uh and then your ability at basketball is the thing that's actually impacting self-esteem right so uh it, it it the waters become very muddied there's there's a whole host of other variables that that could be having an impact on one or both of these such that uh it would be uh very unwise for us to claim that that simply someone's height is is having a causal impact on their self-esteem right uh, we could look at their social group we could look at their family group we could look at their genetics their genetic predispositions uh, we could look at how height impacts other behaviors you know there's there's all kinds of other stuff And lastly, uh, let's talk about external validity. Uh, so to whom can this association generalize? Um, first things first, you have to establish, is external validity important to you? Uh, we've, we've talked about this in the past, previously in the semester. Um, it is perfectly acceptable for a researcher to say, you know, I don't really care that much about external validity because I'm studying an incredibly specific group or phenomena. Uh, I believe uh, an example I've used previously in the class is imagine you're a researcher who studies uh, alcoholism in uh, Native American teenagers, right? Uh, that is an unbelievably specific group of people with, with an unbelievably specific set of circumstances, uh, historically, genetically, uh, socially, economically, right? Um, alcoholic Native American teenagers are, are a very specific subgroup. And the things that we find with them, right, the data we collect with them, the, the conclusions we draw um, might not apply to other people. And we might be okay with that because we're not interested in applying this research to other people. We're interested in helping that specific population. So sometimes external validity maybe is not a priority. Um, most of the time it is. Uh, and so most of the time we want our findings to extend to as many people as possible, right? We get more bang for our research buck if our findings are externally valid. So we sort of have to do make a judgment call about uh, whether external validity is, is something we're even interested in. Uh, often it is, but there are situations where we are not interested. And then the second big thing we'll talk about here is, is what we call moderating variables, um, which can uh, be a problem for external validity. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, this is sort of bleeding over onto the words here, but uh, I think it should be okay. Um, let's look at our example here. We have on the y-axis, how good someone is at multitasking and on the x-axis, we have uh, how often someone multitasks. And so let's imagine that each y is a data point from a young adult, and each o is a data point from an older adult. So. I want you to sort of in your mind's eye first, imagine this scatter plot 
uh, without the Y's and O's. Just imagine that they're all, they all look the same and they're all data points, right? Um, if you were to then peer into them and break them into these two groups, we see that uh, young adults have a sort of maybe small-ish negative correlation and so do older adults, right, when we break them apart. You can see that our graph here has even drawn my, uh, my little cone or oval of uncertainty. And we have, I'd say, small-ish negative correlations for both, meaning that the findings are externally valid with age, right? The, the effect is the same for young people and older people. So we have external validity in this case uh, across the variable of age. We might not have external validity across race, right? We don't know. We don't know what these people's race or ethnicity or even gender is. So it's possible that there's another variable that we are not externally valid on. But at least in this case for age, we are externally valid. And we can see here, oops, sorry, uh, that our line of best fits basically have the same slope. Uh, and so the nature of the relationship between these two variables is the same across our two different uh, age groups. Now, this sort of begs the question, well, what if a variable like in the last example, age, changes the relationship between our, uh, our other two variables? So in this case, going back to this young, old multitasking example, we're actually observing three variables, right? Multitasking score, time spent multitasking, uh, or uh, those are our original variables of interest. And then age is a third variable. Remember how we talked about A, B, and then maybe C impacting the relationship between A and B? So age is actually a third variable. Uh, and when these third variables actually change things, right, when they actually have an impact, we call those moderators. Uh, and moderators, in a sense, mess up our external validity. Right? The point of a moderator is uh, I want you to imagine that the relationship was different between young and older adults. And so we could say, well, multitasking um, score and time spent multitasking have one relationship for younger adults, but they have a different relationship for older adults, right? That's conceivable. It's possible that age changes the relationship between these two variables. And if that's the case, we say that it's a moderator. So here we have uh, an example of a moderator. Our two uh, variables of interest are the success of a sports team and the amount of attendance. So the number of fans that attend the games or matches of that sports team. Uh, one would presume, it would be reasonable to assume that the more successful a team, the more people who attend. So we might be expecting a positive correlation. And in fact, if we look at the city of Phoenix, Arizona, we see exactly that, a small-ish, uh, well, I'm sorry, a moderate-ish correlation, positive correlation, such that in Phoenix, when a sports team is more successful, more people attend the games. Versus Pittsburgh, which has the opposite relationship. It has a negative relationship, meaning the more successful a sports team, the fewer people attend, which is strange. And the authors of this paper, uh, Oishi et al. 2007, suggest that a, a moderator is residential mobility. So essentially how easily people can move about a city. Phoenix has high mobility. Uh, I've actually never been to Phoenix. Maybe they've got great public transportation. Maybe they've got big, great, open, easy highways to access. Uh, I, it's very a very flat place, right? Maybe 
Phoenix is is highly mobile. It's easy to get around. Uh, I have been to Pittsburgh on a couple occasions, and Pittsburgh is actually not very easy to get around. Uh, there's very little public transportation uh, to speak of. Um, Pittsburgh is sort of situated where uh, all of these big rivers and, and mountains all kind of come together in one place, um, which is why Pittsburgh existed in the first place. It was, it was, a, it was a great place for, for trade and, and, um, and manufacturing to then distribute that manufacturing trade easily along the rivers. Uh, but that makes Pittsburgh very difficult to get around. It, it is not an easy place to navigate, uh, and it's not an easy place uh, to be mobile in. And so we see that for high mobility cities, we have this positive correlation, but for low mobility cities, we have the opposite correlation, a negative correlation, an inverse relationship. So what we would say here is that a city's mobility. I can help you find a place when I know your location in security and privacy settings. Choose the privacy tab Sorry, under location Siri services, check enable location services and Siri and dictation. Thank you, Siri, for hijacking my lecture. We'll try not to let that happen again. Um, so what we would say is that a, a city's residential mobility moderates the relationship between a sports team success and their attendance, right? So uh, for highly mobile cities, there's one type of relationship, a positive relationship. But for low mobile cities, there's a different relationship, a negative relationship. So this third variable is impacting our original two variables, which means that there's it, it becomes difficult to assert a causal relationship between success and attendance, right? Because if this other third variable can so dramatically impact our relationship, then something else is going on besides simply success causing attendance, right? It, it's not that simple of a story. We can't just go, oh, yep, a more successful team causes more people to attend. It's more complicated than that, right? There's all this like infrastructure stuff going on, all these other, you know, public transportation, highways, um, what percentage of people own cars, right? There's all kinds of other stuff going on within a city that dictates the relationship between success and attendance. So it would be foolish for us to make a causal claim here because other stuff is going on. And so we can see this here sort of visualized um, on our x-axis, our percentage of wins, our y-axis is attendance. And we can see that Arizona has a, a small to moderate positive correlation and Pittsburgh has a smallish negative correlation, right? The, these two things look very different from one another. Um, so let's do another example of a moderation. Let's let's go back to age. That's an easy moderating variable to understand. Uh, and let's have our other two variables be carrots consumed daily. Um, I don't know who's uh, eating a bunch of carrots every single day, but you know, I assume some people are and some people aren't. Versus blood pressure. Um, then our two lines show the slopes of younger adults and older adults. Now, these, this example uh, visually doesn't have the individual data points and the scatter plots, but I want you to imagine like a bunch of blue dots kind of all around here, right? Like, and we just drew the line of best fit and, and took out the dots for, uh, for the visualization's sake. And for the older adults, we've got a bunch of red dots, right? All over here, we got all their data around the line of best fit. And we just remove those data points so that we can focus on the slope on the on the average relationship. And so here what we find is that for older adults, eating more carrots lowers seems to be associated with lower blood pressure. And for younger adults, eating more carrots is associated with raising your blood pressure. 
So the relationship between blood pressure and carrots depends upon whether you are young or old, right? Depends upon this third variable. Notice that if we average these two slopes together, we would get basically a straight line, meaning uh, no correlation, no association, no relationship between these two variables. So this moderator of age is essentially revealing a hidden effect. Right? If we collapsed young and old adults together, there's no effect. But if we separate younger and older adults and allow that variable to moderate the relationship between blood pressure and carrots, then what emerges is this, this difference uh, that there is actually a relationship. It's just more complicated uh, than we originally thought. It involves more than two variables. We need a third variable. And so this would cause us to uh, take a step back and not want to make a causal claim about carrots and blood pressure because first of all carrots and blood pressure looked like there was no relationship and then when we add a third variable we have differing relationships so just something more complicated is is going on than our ability to just claim carrots uh, the number of carrots consumed has a causal effect on blood pressure it's not that simple and so we would want to hold off and, and just stick with this moderated association claim. Um, so we want to talk about um, the difference between moderators and third variables. So moderators um, are a special type of third variable. Um, so here we have a relationship between GPA and class attendance, right? We, it's a positive relationship, uh, presumably such that uh, the more you attend class, the higher your GPA. Um, something that's a third variable, what we call a third variable, is something that accounts for the relationship between class attendance and GPA. Meaning if we add in the variable motivation, then motivation impacts class attendance and causes class attendance. Motivation also causes GPA and the relationship between attendance and GPA disappears. It goes away when we include this third variable. So third variables are variables that account for the relationship between two other variables. Moderators are variables that change the nature of the relationship between two variables. So here, age doesn't account for the relationship between carrots and blood pressure because there was no relationship between carrots and blood pressure, right? This averaging is, is a zero correlation. It's a nothing. It looks like carrots have nothing to do with blood pressure. But when we add the moderator of age, age changes the relationship between carrots and blood pressure. It doesn't necessarily account for it. It changes the nature of the relationship into a positive and a negative based on where you fall along age. That's a moderator. A What we call a third variable is a variable that simultaneously impacts both, in this example, attendance and GPA, such that if we include this third variable, then the relationship between our original two variables goes away. Right? Motivation is what's actually causing people to attend or not attend class. And motivation is what's causing people to have higher or low GPAs. Maybe perhaps class attendance in and of itself has nothing to do with GPA. It's simply that motivation is simultaneously impacting both of them. So motivation accounts for the relationship. We actually call this a mediation. So when we have a true third variable accounting for a relationship, it mediates the relationship. When we have something that changes the nature of the relationship, it moderates the relationship between our original two variables. So um, here we have, uh, let's just pretend like we're using our same two variables, class attendance and GPA. And we're gonna, we're gonna have an example variable of a moderation, right? So 
In men, there's no relationship between class attendance and GPA. But in women, there is a positive relationship between class attendance and GPA, a very strong one. So moderator, this moderator of gender changes the nature of the relationship between our original two variables, attendance and GPA. Another way to, to tell the difference between a moderator and a mediator, moderators typically put people into groups. They are grouping variables, right? Women and men, in this case, young and old, in this case, right? It's a moderator. Our third variable or our mediator motivation is a continuous variable, right? You could get a score on motivation from one to 100 and it accounts for the original statistical relationship. So mediators or third variables account for relationships and are typically continuous. Moderators change the relationship and are typically uh, categorical. They put people into groups and bins. Okay, some uh, practice questions. Uh, I want you to look at each of these three examples, and I want you to attempt to uh, determine is this positive or negative. I want you to come up with a potential third variable that could explain this relationship, a mediator. And then I want you to come up with a potential moderator, so a grouping variable that could change the original relationship. Uh, I'm actually not going to um, provide any answers to B, C, or D because that's going to vary wildly, and we could sit here and come up with a ton of examples. Um, I, I, when I say I'm not going to provide answers, I mean there's there's no right or wrong uh, answer necessarily, uh, provided that your variable meets the criteria of a moderator or a mediator. Um, what I mean is that there's there's a number of different things that you could uh, you could answer B, C, and D with. Uh, but what I will do really quickly is go through the answers to A, and then I'll provide some possible answers to B, C, and D. So I want you to, to pause uh, the video, take five minutes, uh, try to answer each of these four questions for each of these three examples, and then when you're ready to uh, sort of hear my uh, potential explanations, uh, just click play again. Okay, I hope you're back. Um, let's start with number one. A government study reveals that the more a mother smokes, the more her children exhibit behavioral problems. So the more mom smokes, the more children exhibit behavioral problems. That means that these variables are moving together, right? The more mom smokes, the more problems. The less mom smokes, the fewer problems. So number one is a positive correlation, uh, provide an explanation for the correlation, right? So it's it's possible that um, the uh, carcinogens in, in smoke, uh, particularly maybe cigarette smoke, um, has an impact on prenatal brain development, right? Such that um, when children grow up, uh, their brains are different. They have maybe less inhibitory ability uh, and thus exhibit behavioral problems. Like that's a possible explanation between mother smoking and uh, children's later behavior problems. What's a potential third variable that could explain this relationship? Um, maybe, <coughs> excuse me, um, maybe family income, right? Um, so we know typically that uh, people of lower income are more likely to smoke. And it's also possible that um, children exhibit more behavioral problems in a, in a low income family, or maybe children also exhibit more behavioral problems in a high income family. Like uh, the variable of income uh, could potentially have an, an explanatory relationship with both of these variables. And what's a potential moderator? Um, you know, maybe education level. Uh, so maybe, uh, maybe 
this relationship between smoking and behavioral problems looks one way for mothers um, with a college degree and looks different for mothers without a college degree. Like that, that's plausible, right? Okay, let's look at number two. Researchers investigating the relationship between alcohol and memory found that higher doses of alcohol were associated with increasingly lower scores on a test of memory recall. Is this positive or negative? It's negative because as one increases, right, as dosage of alcohol increases, we have lower scores on memory recall. So it's a negative correlation. Uh, you know, this one's, it's pretty easy to explain. Um, you know, alcohol, um, at, once it reaches a certain point, actually shuts down uh, the hippocampus, which is necessary for creating memories. And so uh, we actually have fairly good evidence for a causal relationship uh, between these two variables. Um, it's possible, however, that there's a third variable that could explain this relationship, um, maybe something like activity in the hippocampus, right? Um, uh, could, could explain and mediate the relationship between alcohol use and memory recall. And a potential moderator, uh, D, maybe gender, um, has an impact, right? Um, maybe this differentially impacts men and women. That's plausible. Maybe weight, right? We know that the impact of alcohol depends upon weight, uh, maybe that is a moderator. People who are heavier um, uh, have a different relationship than people who are lighter. Could be any number of things. And number three, a survey of adolescents noted those who watch the most TV during the week receive the lowest ratings on a measure of general health. So more TV means lower general health. That's a negative correlation. Um provide an explanation. Um, maybe adolescents who watch more TV spend less time with their friends, right? Uh, and so um, they have poor general health. Maybe they're not getting as much exercise. Um, you know, who knows, right? Uh, th there could be any number of explanations for this uh, association. What's a possible third variable that could explain this relationship? Um, so we need a continuous variable that could explain high TV watching and low general health. Maybe, um, oh, what could it be? Maybe, you know, maybe income. Um, maybe uh, income's kind of an easy one to, to think of with, with health in general, the same thing as, as, as number one with smoking and behavioral problems. Uh, but maybe it's possible that, you know, people who are low income, watch more TV, and also have lower health ratings. And what's really happening is income or you know access to health care, something like that. That's what's actually um, uh, creating or explaining the relationship. And lastly, a potential moderator um, could be what you watch on TV. Uh, if the adolescent does nothing but watch, you know, um, stupid reality shows on MTV and TLC, then this relationship might be the case, right? That the more TV you watch, the lower your general health. Maybe the adolescents who do nothing but watch, um, you know, documentaries and educational um, content or, you know, um, maybe Animal Planet, right? Or Planet Earth, stuff like that. Maybe those adolescents would have a different relationship between TV and general health. Maybe it depends upon what kind of TV you're watching. That could very easily moderate this relationship. All right, well, that wraps up part two for chapter eight, bivariate correlation. Uh, check back in to the part three lecture, um, which will be a new set of lecture slides over hypothesis testing with correlations. So in that lecture, we're gonna learn how to actually do the math behind a correlation. Uh, and then how to do our dis our hypothesis testing decision making process and write up APA style conclusions. So thanks everybody, and I will talk to you next time in part three. Thanks.